Greetings, I'm Dr. Eric Landrum from the Department of Psychology at Boise State University, and this is my Psych 487 Capstone Perspectives History and Systems Lecture on Alternatives to Structuralism. One of the notions, before I actually jump into information about Herbert Ebbinghaus that I want to just to kind of remind listeners of, is that um, even though we tend to cover things in the history of psychology in a systems method, which is, you know, there's, you know, Wundtian psychology and there's structuralism and functionalism and behaviorism, neo-behaviorism, all this stuff. We tend to think of these in a sequential order, but one of the things I want to point out, especially with today's lecture, is that there are certainly overlapping and alternative methods of pursuing psychology going on simultaneously. That is, even though it might have been the heyday of structuralism from 1890 to 1920, there are other people doing work in other areas, and other parts of the world, and within other domains within psychology. And so uh, there may be a predominant domain like behaviorism from the 1920s to the 1960s, but there are other approaches being followed as well. Some of those approaches still exist to this day, whereas others have pretty much gone out of vogue and we'd be hard pressed to find any proponents, for example, of structuralism. Although I think you could probably find a handful of Gestalt psychologists who would still call themselves that. And clearly the Gestalt approach and the Gestalt ideas are still very much alive to this day. So even though we kind of tend to look at this in chunks and a linear format, I just wanted to point out to you that there are also going to be other simultaneously occurring um, structures and approaches to psychology going on in all sorts of parts of the world at any time in the history of psychology. All right, now, so one of those alternatives to structuralism somewhat going on simultaneously would be uh, the individual work of Herming Ebbinghaus. And you can see here on the screen, uh, and uh, oh, it looks like a, a picture of an artist painting of Ebbinghaus uh, who lived from 1850 to 1909. Uh, Herman Ebbinghaus was uh, influenced by Fechner. He worked in Germany. Uh, he really had no personal acquaintances in psychology. He wasn't well connected. This would be the guy who we would say did not do a good job of networking. He pretty much did his own thing. I believe he was at the University of Berlin. We're going to see those details here in a little bit. Um, so influenced by Fechner, he picks up his Fechner's book, Elements of Psychophysics, uh, buys it in a used bookstore, and he looks at that as a method of uh, looking at uh, the experimental side of psychology that Fechner discusses in that book. And Ebbinghaus's personal interest was in memory, in memory persistence over time, really memory and forgetting. So that's a bit of the setup of where we're headed here. And so um, Ebbinghaus, for quite some time, for over five years, he actually con conducted studies of his own about memory. And what's interesting, if you ask the question, well, how many participants did he run in his studies? Did he run them in groups or individually? The answer is, the person he studied for memory was himself in a very systematic series of experiments of which you'll see a little bit of data of in a later slide. And so Ebbinghaus studied the makings of associations, not really the content of memory. And so um, he wasn't like a pure introspectionist, as we've seen of uh, researchers of the past preceding Ebbinghaus. Uh, so for five years, he, he studies uh, his own memory. And then in 1880, he becomes a lecturer at the University of Berlin. And so he does get into academia, but he's really not well connected. He's not like Wundt and, you know, the folks of the day who would have, you know, been traveling overseas and going to conferences and things like that. In 1885, after five years of testing himself after he gets to the University of Berlin, he writes a famous book in the German called Über das Gedachtnis, which translates to On Memory. And it is an unusually original work. Not only is his research unusually original, but the contribution of his research really still exists to this day. And so, for example, in nearly every introductory psychology textbook you could find, open up to chapter six, which is probably the memory chapter, and you will find the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And I will show you a picture of that here momentarily. But first off, he was just a real methodologist. I mean, he really was was thoughtful about this. So look at this first bullet. So Urban he Herman Ebbinghaus developed what we call nonsense syllables. He posited, he kind of theorized that, you know, words have meanings. 
And so if I memorize doctor nurse, that's just not two words, but there's a connection between doctor and nurse that might help me remember those two words in the series of words to be remembered. And so what Ebbinghaus invented were nonsense syllables. And you can see some, they're called CVCs, consonant, vowel, consonant. So zat, bach, raf, geb. Um, he, he thought that poetry and prose already had associations and memory cues. And so if he made up nonsense words, they would be relatively pure. They'd be relatively uncontaminated. Therefore, he could get a purer test of memory as opposed to using words that already had associations. Uh, he actually came up with a very nice dependent variable measure in such a way that he get a, a score. Uh, Ebbinghaus called that percent savings. And so what he would do, let's say he would take a list of 12 nonsense syllables, take a list of 12 nonsense syllables, and he would, with a timer, he would time how long did it take him to memorize those so that he could recall those 12 perfectly, okay? And so that would be what he would call the original learning effort. So it might have taken him a half hour, it might have taken him 45 minutes. Then he would wait a period of time. So he might come back a day later, a week later, and he would say to himself, self, I'm going to recall that list of 12 items that I memorized a while back. And then he would measure uh, how long um, he would measure his memory performance. But then he would really, he was more interested in how long did it take him to re-memorize the list until he could recall it perfectly. And so that, so his percent savings, it's a little formula here that's embedded in this text, would be the original learning effort minus the relearning effort divided by the original learning effort, and you multiply that all by 100. And so he might see 80% savings or 60% savings. Uh, and what he proposed is that the longer the interval between the first learning and the relearning, the less savings there would be. Okay, so that over time, you lose your savings. So if I memorize that list of, of nonsense syllables right now and came back five minutes from now, there should be high percent savings. I, it really shouldn't take me a long time to re-memorize that list to perfection. So I might have 95% savings. But a week from now, I might only have 30% savings. It might take me quite a bit of time to relearn the list to perfection, but not the list of nonsense syllables and the recall. So that that's the methodology that uh, Ebbinghaus used with his nonsense syllables and his forgetting curve. And here's a nice example of the real data. And you can see that savings formula over here is a little bit more looking like a formula, although it is sideways. The original learning minus the relearning divided by the original learning times 100 would give us a percentage. And you can see the actual data from Ebbinghaus both here numerically and also here is the classic Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And so if you memorize the list of perfection and then right smack you turned around and did it immediately, you still remembered everything. There was 100% savings. The relearning effort would have been zero. All right. But an hour later, look what happens an hour later. See, here's an hour, 44% uh, savings. Okay. And you can see at 19 minutes, about 60% savings. And at 525 minutes, here's one day. So one day later, there's 33% savings. By 31 days out, a month later, there's 21% savings. So a very nice demonstration that as time passes, memories fade, and there is less amount percent savings, which means it will take more effort to remember and come back to a perfect recollection of the nonsense syllables. A very nice demonstration of using nice experimental controls. He used himself as the participant in the study. He was very controlled. He thought about nonsense syllables. He thought about associations with poetry and prose. He kept great records. You know, he was very methodical. He repeated this series of studies over five years before he even went to publish them. For over five years, he did these things to himself, multiple lists over multiple times with multiple trials. And so you can see how he was careful to make sure these data were reliable uh, and that uh, really good methodology that he used, especially uh, for that era of the time, which makes this, you know, even uh, this data unusually valuable. And one of the reasons why it's still reported in introductory psychology textbooks to this day. So the data, as I just said, are still valuable. And it's kind of interesting to contrast this with Wundt and Titchener. You know, very few people can recall the data or the contributions of Wundt and Titchener. When you think about Wundt and Titchener, you think about the foundings of psychology. You think about their students. You think about their PhD students and who, did, who, they, who they supervised their dissertations 
Uh, with Ebbinghaus, there are no lasting students, but his data are still quite good and, like I say, are cited in just about nearly every introductory psychology memory chapter that you'll find uh, in books published today. One other thing before we leave this notion of Ebbinghaus is that he's very famous for this uh, statement that he uttered in 1885, that psychology has a long past but a short history. A classic quote about the history of psychology that comes from Herman Ebbinghaus. And so the notion being the long past is that since there's been human beings, there's been human beings interested in human behavior. But as a science, psychology has a short history. It hasn't, you know, and think about it from his perspective in 1885, you know, uh, we give the founding of psychology to Wundt in 1879. So he's talking about this when it was six years old. And so psychology, that study of human behavior, has a long past out of philosophy departments and ever since the existence of humankind, I would imagine. But as a science and studied as a science, you know, for him, six years, 1885, a short history. And really to this day, we still actually say this quotation and mean it. Uh, if you compare the history of psychology from a scientific perspective, say to chemistry or physics or biology, uh, psychology is a relative newborn. It's a maybe, ah, maybe not a newborn. Maybe psychology is more of a uh, not teenager, but preteen. And so uh, maybe one of those preens there that, you know, 10, 12 years old, so to speak, as again, compared to, you know, chemistry or physics or biology, which have hundreds, if not thousands of years of history compared to, depending on uh, who you uh, talk to and what you read about. So, Herbert Ebbinghaus, another alternative to structuralism, ongoing at the same time, different country, you know, Germany compared to the U.S. And so there's not just one thing going on in psychology at any time in its history. And so there are multiple ideas going on. There are multiple alternatives to whatever the mainstream view is at any given time in the history of psychology. All right, to switch gears, I want to talk to you a little bit about Gestalt psychology, which is another alternative to structuralism that's happening roughly the same time. And quite honestly, the notions of Gestalt psychology outlast, you know, the contributions of structuralism. And so Gestalt psychology is founded as a revolt against this notion of this mechanical compartmentalism of Wundtian psychology. And so this atomistic elementary, you know, we break things down to as pieces and parts and Gestalt psychologists were antithetical to that. They wanted no part of that. They wanted to see the whole. In fact, the very famous phrase that we'll get to here pretty soon, where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so the Gestalt psychologists of the time would have criticized structuralism and Wundtian psychology as being this atomistic, mechanical, we tear stuff apart to look at the pieces and parts, fine, whatever, but there's more to it. When you put these pieces and parts together and they operate in their normal environment, there's something greater there than just pieces and parts. We can uh, look at a car engine, but when you take all the pieces and parts and put them together, you get something that's very different, that runs, that new things can happen, that uh, it's just more than the sum of the parts. So, and Gestalt psychology is going to really be one of our first examples that we talk about where a new idea, a new system within psychology is actually launched as a revolt against an existing system. So sometimes it's actually easier to get proponents of an idea when you can fight against something that currently exists. And so, I mean, think about political parties. I mean, you know, the Republicans could obviously run on what they want to run on, but they oftentimes like to couch it in the phrase of, well, we don't like what the Democrats are doing, so look at us, where the Republicans are doing something different. Uh, with the same type of analogy or analogous situation it happens in psychology as well. So these Gestalt psychologists don't like what Wundt is doing. They don't like the ideas that he's proposing and how to study human behavior. So the Gestalt psychologists come up with their own viewpoint that is launched as a revolt against, you know, the current status quo, if you will. And so Gestalt psychologists come along and they have some criticisms of Wundt and that, you know, uh, the behaviorists, by the way, are also going to criticize the one. They're going to say that consciousness does not even exist. We'll get to that in a few weeks from now. But the, the Gestalt psychologists will take a, an alternative viewpoint that says the study of consciousness is okay, but don't tear it down to its parts. Try to study it as it is. 
in the, they called uh, Wundtian psychology, interestingly, brick and mortar psychology. And so, you know, if you look at the structure of a building, it could be, you know, you know, minimized into, or I shouldn't say minimized, it could be uh, analyzed into its basic component parts, which is a building is the brick and the mortar that holds it together. And I think a lot of people would argue that buildings can come to represent much more than just brick and mortar. Well, that's the exact notion that Gestalt psychologists took, that human behavior and study psychology is much more than just the mere pieces and parts of consciousness. It's what happens in consciousness. It's what happens, you know, when the brain and body are operating in the natural environment. And so it's more than just the sum of its parts. So, and, and here's that classic phrase. It's that middle uh, bullet there, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But the basic notion of uh, Gestalt psychology, there's all kinds of neat examples of this and behavioral phenomena and even in optical illusions, which we'll see some here in a little bit. The basic notion is that when these sensory elements are combined, something new happens. And so uh, you can take individual notes on the staff of some music and then all of a sudden you combine these notes in a certain way and you get a melody. And the melody is actually something different from the combination of individual notes. New sounds are formed. We hear new things. Uh, there's a really classic one in, in psychology, in Gestalt psychology, called the fee phenomenon. And if you can think of a marquee, a movie marquee, where you might have what are called running lights, and it looks like the lights are moving around the marquee to a movie theater. Well, actually, there's no moving lights. It's just a sequence of light bulbs where... Um, the light goes on and off in a very particular sequence, and it looks like the lights are moving, but they're actually not. It's just the light is going on and off in a very particular sequence. Well, the whole, which looks like lights that are moving, or the melody, is greater than the sum of its individual parts, whether that be individual musical notes or a light bulb going on and off. And so this basic fundamental notion of Gestalt psychology is that two things, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and perception goes beyond the basic physical data. Again, if you hearken back to any you know, typical introductory psychology textbook being published today, you're either going to find a chapter on sensation and perception or two separate chapters, one on sensation, one on perception. So sensation is that data collection, you know, gathering the information from the environment, uh, light waves hitting the retina in the back of your eye and being transduced to the brain and being interpreted, you know, traveling through the uh, optic chiasm. Um, the perception is what your brain makes sense of. And so, and one of the, one of the neat examples of this is magic. So if you're a fan of magic, you know, sensations are telling you one thing, perceptions are telling you another. So your eyes are seeing something, but your brain is saying, hey, wait a second, that thing can't disappear, or it can't reappear like that, what's going on? And so magic is one of these really cool things that plays on this dichotomy between sensation and perception. And so for Gestalt psychologists, perception goes beyond the basic physical data. It's more than the data collection. It's how our brains analyze the data that were presented. And probably, you know, the most, I don't know if we call him the founder, we'd have to actually talk to some Gestalt psychologists to figure this part out. But the, well, maybe the founder or the most famous uh, Gestalt psychologist was Max Wertheimer, who lived from 1880 to 1943. He gets this idea of uh, Gestalt psychology in 1910. I guess we would give him the credit for formal founding in 1912. He's on the faculty at the University of Frankfurt. He works with two other German psychologists who are going to become famous in the history of psychology, which we really won't talk about too much, Kurt Kafka and Wolfgang Kohler. And Kohler is famous for some of the uh, insight studies with apes on uh, Tenerife and uh, during World War One, where he gets trapped on an island for eight years, and he might as well just figure out, you know, some things about human behavior. He watch he watches apes learn how to problem solve. Anyway, and, and by the way, and here's that example I, I told you earlier about the fee phenomenon, the perception of apparent movement. That would be that uh, movie marquee, and so when the lights going on and off. Uh, this would be like uh, you probably have a string of Christmas tree lights to do this, that you might have a control on, that you might make them flash in a certain sequence, and it might look like that the light is moving around the tree, when in fact the lights aren't moving at all, the lights are stationary on your tree, but uh, uh, the lights are going on and off in such a sequence that it makes it look like the lights are moving. A very famous student of Max Furtimer would be Abraham Maslow, and you've 
undoubtedly heard this name before, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. We'll talk about him a little bit later in the semester when we talk about humanism, the third force in psychology. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. And I just wanted to point out that Max Wertheimer's son is Michael Wertheimer, and Michael Wertheimer may be one of, if not the last living vestige to true Gestalt psychologist, Michael Wertheimer, I believe, is at the University of Colorado. And uh, if you go to the Rocky Mountain Psychological Association, he tends to be quite active. And so if you were to head there for their annual convention, odds are you could actually run into Michael Wertheimer, a real life throwback to uh, the days when Gestalt psychology was in its heyday. There's probably not a lot of people who would label themselves Gestalt psychologists today, but clearly Gestalt psychology has an impact. That approach has an impact, especially, as you can imagine, within the notions of sensation perception. So people who are S&P psychologists, and that really is a specialty, sensation perception, might very well have strong allegiances to this notion of Gestalt psychology. So there are some basic principles. I'm just going to give you an example of a couple of them. If you did a Google search on any of these, you'd find some really fun um, optical illusions. You might even hear some uh, auditory illusions as well. Um, I'm going to try to show you one called the Shepherd's Table here in just a second. Um, but I would really encourage you just, you know, or, or grab your intrasite textbook if you still have that, open up to that chapter on sensation perception. There'll be all kinds of great uh, visual illusions in your textbook. So Wertheimer's idea in 1923 was that there are certain um, patterns that we look for. They are spontaneous. They're inevitable. Our brain fills in the blanks. And so things that may not be there, we will see even if they're not there. You know, we have been trained. Our brains have, you know, have evolved to a certain point in time where we look for completed holes. And so he offered these he and his colleagues over time offered these four different principles of perceptual organization, proximity, similarity, closure, and pregnance. And I don't know if I have an example of all of them, but I definitely have some examples of some of these principles. So here's an example of the principle of proximity. The notion that parts that are close together in time and space tend to be perceived better. So for instance, you uh, even though there are eight black blocks here that I'm circling with my cursor, you probably see these as two groups of four. In fact, it's probably difficult to not see them as two groups of four, even though there's eight altogether, the same shape and size. And so because of the proximity of these four and these four with a gap in between, we see these as two kind of blockings. The same notion is, is perceived down here. This is a six by six matrix of dots. Here are 36 dots. We see this as a nice little square. But this one we see as uh, three horizontal, I'm sorry, three vertical lines of two rows each. And so we'll see that by spacing these images apart or together will influence how we see them and how we perceive them, even how we might describe them as someone, you know, we, we might describe this as a six by six matrix, but odds are you would not describe this as a six by six matrix because there's some gaps there. There's some spaces there. And so um, that would be the notion of proximity with regard to principles of perceptual organization. Here's another one of similarity, that the similar parts tend to be seen together as forming a group. And so once again, by the way, this is a six by six matrix, but you probably see rows of white dots and rows of black dots. And so um, because the dots are similar to one another and they're adjacent to one another, we're going to see these as rows. Even though there are six columns of white and black dots, odds are your eye is automatically, you know, attuned to, and it's really not your eye so much as your brain, it's not the sensation, but the, the, your perceptions are automatically tuned to the items that are similar are grouped together. There, you see that as a group, and so you might see that as three rows of white dots and three rows of black dots, and not a six by six matrix, which it actually is. Here's another example of uh, Wertheimer's principles of perceptual organization with regard to closure. I think this is the classic World Wildlife Funda Foundation image, you know, this panda bear. And so we see this panda bear as a bear, even though, you know, this is an ear floating in space, with all due respect to you. I mean, this is an ear floating in space, but we fill it in. And this, this little dis depiction down here kind of gives you the dotted lines our brain does the fill-in. We fill in the gap. And so we don't need a physical line connecting the back of the bear's hind end to its middle portion of its body. And we don't need a physical line that outlines the entire head. In fact, you can take that line out, and our brains still see it anyway. 
So we don't see this as a bunch of dots. We see the whole, and there it is. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so we see the face of the bear, even though there's not a line here, there's not a line here. That's that principle of closure, our tendency to perceive incomplete figures as complete. We fill in the gaps. We want to complete incomplete figures. This is a great one. This is the law of pregnance. And so we're going to see this as a triangle, a circle, and a square. All right. But, uh, but to be honest with you, there's really only of those three, a true triangle there. This red thing right here is actually looks like a circle, but it's kind of like a pizza slice cut out of it. And this blue thing is really kind of an odd shaped thing. So we see the square, even though we can't see the square. Does that make much sense? That was, that was pretty prophetic there, wasn't it? Very deep. And so the tendency to see a figure as being good under possible stim under possibly different stimulus conditions. So good meaning symmetrical, simple, and stable. You know, this is the classic figure ground. You've seen the vase or two faces kind of example. You've seen the young lady or the old lady. There's really classic ones in your intro psych textbook. And so we tend to see this as a square, a circle, and a triangle, when in fact that's really not what might be there. All right, now here's one where we'll see if I can get this to work. This is a really cool illusion. It's called the Shepherd's Table Illusion. Um, if it doesn't work for me right now, you can actually see the URL on your screen and, and just write that or click on that, right click or save it or something and, and check it out. But I'm going to see if I can make it work here so that we can check it out together. All right, it looks like it might work. So here we go. So um, this is just this website right here. You can go check it out yourself. This is really cool because this tabletop right here is the exact same shape as this tabletop right here. I'm going to get rid of that. And so look at those two tables. So this tabletop right here, see it's got outlined in black, is the same shape. Is that when you're going, no way, no way, no way. Well, actually, way. So here's this really cool thing. This is not a trick. This is not optical illusion. There's been no trickery here with the website. Now it's been programmed. But here it is. Watch this. You can actually watch the physical shape, how it's not being changed at all, and it actually truly is the exact same thing. We have a hard time seeing that. Our brain wants to tell us those tabletops are two different things. It's all about perspective. It's all about the angle that we see it. But as you see this go back and forth, you can see that um, this uh, tabletop is the exact same shape. All right. And so our sensations that we're getting that come into our brain get interpreted by the perceptions uh, that's going on by the processing in the brain. And it's really hard for us to see that. And so, again, just a nice example of how this sensation perception are complementary processes, but we get tricked from time to time. And we typically like those tricks. We like optical illusions. We like magic. It kind of intrigues us. It kind of gets uh, it gets us to think about things from a different perspective. Okay, so now back to the show. All right, so just kind of to start to sum up and give you some uh, big ideas about the impact of Gestalt psychology. Um, it did spread in America. It didn't really become mainstream. Although Gestalt psychology was a revolt against Wundt, American behaviorism had already revolted, and kind of this notion of revolting against Wundt becomes a dead issue. And so you can kind of see some overlap now. So we've got Wundtian psychology into structuralism in the U.S. We've got the beginnings of behaviorism in 1910, 1912. We've got the same thing, the beginnings of Gestalt psychology, another revolt against Wundtian psychology about the same time, 1910, 1912. So what happens, though, is though Gestalt psychology does gain a bit of a foothold, its revolt against Wundtian psychology will be overshadowed by the revolt of behaviorism against Wundtian psychology. And so, although you still see vestiges of the influence of Gestalt psychologists to this day, um, Gestalt psychology shifts its attack to being against behaviorism eventually. Um, you know, if you can't get, you know, what it was, the classic thing with kids. If you can't get attention being good, get attention being bad. And what I'm suggesting here is that if Gestalt psychology could not gain traction revolt against Wundtianism, then it's going to gain traction by revolting against whatever's popular at the day, which was after Wundtian psychology, it was behaviorism. <laughs> 
Gestalt psychology has a huge influence on later uh, figures within the history of psychology. Kurt Leuven, his field theory of personality. So if you've ever had the personality course, uh, you would have undoubtedly talked about Kurt Leuven and his influence, as well as, as Jean Piaget. And so Piaget's, you know, stages of childhood development, all kinds of things that you would have learned about, both in introductory psychology and in child psych courses. Uh, and so uh, Piaget and Leuven are both going to be influenced by the um, the antecedent uh, notions of 